comes with a gold medal. Uh, people also know that the Nobel Prize comes with some money. And both of these are very nice, but what I didn't know is that the Nobel Prize also comes with a diploma. This slide shows my Nobel diploma. And if you read it at the end, assuming you can all read Swedish, um, you'll see that in part what it says is that this prize was awarded for understanding the genetic control of programmed cell death. So what does this mean? Why did I receive a Nobel Prize for studying the genetic control of programmed cell death? Let me back up to some of the words. Genetics, cell, programmed cell death. Genetics. Genetics is the study of genes. Genes are responsible for all of the biological processes that, in, that occur in living organisms. Genes are the basis of heredity. Each of us has inherited half of our genes from our father and half of our genes from our mother. Genes can vary amongst individuals. So we are all genetically distinct, but we are genetically more similar to each other than we are to other species. Variations in genes can also cause or predispose us to disease. And many, many diseases are diseases caused by abnormalities in genes and many other diseases we are more susceptible to, more likely to get if we carry specific genetic variants. And these diseases include cancer, cardiovascular disorders, asthma, cystic fibrosis, premature aging, Alzheimer's disease, bone loss, and I could go on and on with diseases that are caused by or influenced by our, by our genes. So genes are important to us and they are crucial to our health. So how can we learn about our genes? How can we learn what they do and how they sometimes go wrong? Now one approach is to study our genes, human genes, and many biologists and biomedical researchers do precisely this. I do this. I study human genes that are responsible for the neurodegenerative disease amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, or ALS. But there's a difficulty in studying human genes. Such studies in many ways are slow and inefficient, and there are many types of studies that you simply cannot do with people. So one wants to be able to study genes including human genes, in some more rapid analytical fashion than can be done easily with our own genes. Fortunately, biology has provided us with an approach to solving this problem. And that's based upon the fact that many genes are strikingly conserved amongst different organisms. And what this means is that we can study genes in experimental organisms, easily studied organisms, learn what they do in these organisms, and then extrapolate from that information to what they do in us, and then test the hypotheses to determine if, in fact, this is true. So many experimental organisms are used in modern biomedical research. For example, to study genes, people will study mice, or zebrafish, or fruit flies, or yeast, single-celled organisms that are used to brew beer and bake bread. Another organism that is commonly used today in genetic studies is a microscopic roundworm, a nematode. It's called Cenorhabditis elegans, or C. elegans for short, and this is the organism that I have studied. And I'll turn back to C. elegans in a few moments and tell you a little about it. 
So those are some words about genetics. Now what about cell? What is a cell? In short, a cell is the fundamental unit of life. Our bodies are made up of cells, skin cells, muscle cells, blood cells, nerve cells, and so on. We have genes, we have cells, what about programmed cell death? Programmed cell death refers to naturally occurring cell death, i.e. cell death that occurs as a normal part of the genetic program of every animal. And let me explain in more detail what I mean by that. When an animal develops, such as us, we begin as a fertilized egg. Sperm and egg come together. That makes a single cell. It divides to make two. Those two divide to make four, and so on over and over again until many cells are present. Um, in us, as many as 10 million million cells in each of us. Then these cells take on specific characteristics, becoming nerve cells, muscle cells, blood cells and so on, and the cells interact to form structures like hands and a nose and, in a more complicated way, a brain. These processes of cell division, cell differentiation, and morphogenesis are the fundamental processes of development, of animal development, and of the field of developmental biology. Now, in addition to these fundamental processes, there is another process that is universal amongst animals, and that is the process of cell death. Quite remarkably, and I would say rather counterintuitively, many of the cells that are generated as animals develop do not survive, but rather die. And it's this naturally occurring cell death that is referred to as programmed cell death. The phenomenon of programmed cell death has been known for many years. For example, if you think about a tadpole as it metamorphoses into a frog, the tadpole loses its tail. The tail is made of cells, and those cells die. That is programmed cell death. If you consider a human infant in utero, when a baby is developing between its digits, its fingers and its toes, there is webbing. The webbing is made of cells, and that webbing is removed before birth by the process of programmed cell death. If you think about birds, particularly bird feet, some are webbed, some are not. The ones that are not, there has been programmed cell death, the ones that are webbed, there is no programmed cell death. Programmed cell death can be a major event. As our brains develop, as many as 85% of the nerve cells that are generated die. As we sit here today, in our blood, many of the blood cells, 95% of a particular kind of blood cell known as a thymocyte, 95% of the thymocytes generated will die by programmed cell death. So programmed cell death is widespread in biology. Yet, until a few years ago, biologists paid little attention to this phenomenon. And the reason, I think, was that when one thinks about the challenges of life, how do you make life? That seemed like a big problem, and the default, I think, was if it didn't work right, then you get death. So dying cells were cells that had been mistreated, cells that had been harmed, cells that had not been supplied with appropriate nutrients, and not interesting, because that was a default. What I and my colleagues discovered was that this view is incorrect. Rather, there is a biology of cell death every bit as much as there is a biology of other fundamental biological processes like cell division and cell differentiation and morphogenesis. 
and that there are specific genes that act to make cells die. So I've been talking now about cell death and the biology of cell death, and in fact, any biology, any human biology, if it goes wrong in us, can lead to disease. And it turns out that scientists have been finding in recent years that program cell death, now that we're thinking about it, is no exception to this. Many diseases are diseases of a misregulation of program cell death. There are diseases in which there is too much cell death. For example, neurodegenerative diseases in which certain nerve cells die, Alzheimer's disease, Huntington's disease, Parkinson's disease, um, notably certain retinal diseases which cause blindness. Um, stroke, brain cells die. Traumatic brain injury, uh, aspects of AIDS. Um, heart cells die in heart attacks and congestive heart failure. Many liver diseases, including infection with hepatitis C virus, involves deaths of liver cells. And it turns out that these liver cells are dying using the same genes that are normally used by us when we develop. These genes have been unleashed at the wrong time or in the wrong cell, causing these cells to die. On the other hand, there are diseases in which there is too little cell death, certain autoimmune diseases, and also cancer. We think about cancer as coming from cells dividing and dividing and dividing, uncontrollably generating too many cells. But what is happening in our bodies is that many tissues have cells in a number that is defined by two opposing processes. Cells are being added by cell division, and cells are being taken away by cell death. And we can get too many cells either because there is too much cell division or because there is too little cell death. And certain cancers are more fundamentally diseases of too little program cell death than of cell division per se, like follicular lymphoma exemplified in this slide. And in fact, all cancers seem to involve too little cell death. And when we treat cancers with radiation or with chemotherapy, what we are doing is activating that endogenous program for program cell death and making our cells express this program that is used normally developmentally to cause cells to die. So it was our discoveries about the understanding of the process of program cell death, in fact, that led to the Nobel Prize. And we analyzed this process not in, by studying it in humans, but rather by studying this microscopic worm, one millimeter long, so tiny you can barely see it with the naked eye, this microscopic worm, C. elegans. Three of us shared the prize. My co-recipients were Sidney Brenner and John Sulston. Sidney introduced C. elegans to the field of modern biology, and he worked out the basic methods for the study of this organism. He chose the organism because it is very small and very simple and very easily studied. John Sulston worked with Sydney in Cambridge, England, in the lab laboratory of molecular biology from the Medical Research Council. And John studied the developmental biology of C. elegans, and in particular, he studied that pattern of cell divisions that occurs beginning with the single-celled fertilized egg and ultimately generating the adult animal. And John studied the complete pattern of this so-called cell lineage, 
C. elegans is the only animal for which we know the